Hello everyone and welcome to part 4 of JavaScript level 1, Operators. It's time to learn about comparison and logical operators with JavaScript. And these operators are going to allow us to begin to add logic to our JavaScript code. And as a quick note, there are also five optional quick exercises at the end of this lecture and you can find them under the part 4 underscore operators dot js file that's under the JavaScript level 1 folder. Okay, let's hop to our console and get started. Okay, so here I have the editor open as well as my browser and I have the console open in my browser. And remember you can always just right click, hit inspect, and then go over to the console. And on this left hand side I have the actual course notes open. So what we're going to be doing is quickly reviewing booleans. Remember they're all lowercase, it's just true and false. And what we want to do is start off with comparison operators. And comparison operators allow us to compare two items and return a boolean. And I want you to pay special attention to what happens when we actually reach equality and we test if something's equal or not. So we'll start off with the simple ones, which are things such as greater than. So if I check is three greater than two, well that's true. Is two greater than three, that's false. So that's greater than, there's also less than, so one less than two. There's greater than or equal to, so is two greater than two, well that's false, but is two greater than or equal to two, that's true. So there's greater than or equal to, and there's also less than or equal to. So we can see here. Let me clear my console to come back up here. And now what I want to do is take a little bit of time to discuss equality and its special quirk. So let's say I ask is two equals equals two. Well, that returns true. And typically in a lot of languages, this would be how you test for equality. And this would also work for things such as strings. So, so if I have something like user as a string and I check equals equals user, then it returns true. But here's where it gets a little strange. Let's say I have a string called two and I say equals equals two. And I wanna see if this is true or not. If I hit enter on this, JavaScript, unlike a lot of other programming languages, is actually gonna report that this is true. And usually you do not want this to be true. You do not want a string to to be equal to the actual number two. So how do we actually take care of this situation? Well, what you end up doing is just adding another equal sign there. So you report back equals 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 two. And this will be now false. So if you want to check equality of not just the actual number here, what it's saying, but of actual type, you wanted to use triple equal sign. Okay, so let's take a little bit of time to discuss the real differences between the triple equal sign, which returns false, and the double equal sign, which returns true in this situation. And what's happening when you only use two equal signs is JavaScript is using what's known as type coercion, which basically means it's trying its best to convert both of the objects to similar data types to actually perform the comparison. And a lot of times you don't actually want that. You want to compare two objects based not just on what they represent to a user, but what they actually represent in the data type space. So one is a string, one is a number, they shouldn't be the same. So the way you do that is you add in that extra equal sign to have three equal signs there. And you actually do the same thing with inequality. So if you want to check inequality, not just the value, but also of data type, you do this. So I want to check is five not equals to five, the string, that ends up being true. So I add the equal sign there. If I only used one equal sign here, then I would have gotten false. So remember, for most use cases, we want to add in that extra equal sign. So we want three equal signs to test for equality, and then an exclamation mark, two equal signs to test for inequality. So here, this is saying that the digit five is truly not equal to the string five. If I only use one of these in this case, so I don't add that extra equal sign, it'll say something like the digit is actually not not equal to five. And it's a little weird because there's a double negative here, the in falsely unequal. So just to clarify, you'll always want to use the triple equal signs and then exclamation mark two equal signs for inequality. Okay. So we always want to check for equality and inequality, not just the value, but also of type. So let's talk about a few more situations. It's really common in programming languages for zero and one 
to be substitutes for true and false. And let me show you what I mean by that. I'm going to clear this and we can actually scroll down the notes and see what I'm talking about here. If I say true is equal equal to one, I actually get true back. And if I check as true equals 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 to one, I get false back. So this is just a quick note that a lot of times we can see one as far as the type coercion and how JavaScript's trying to get types to compare to each other, I could have also used one to kind of act as true. And the same goes for zero and false. So false equals equals zero, that returns true. But if I'm checking not just for value, but also for data type, then I get false here. Okay, so that's a little bit of a quirky behavior if you haven't seen this before in other programming languages. And there's also a little bit of a weird behavior for null, undefined, and NAN values. So if I check does null equals equals undefined, I end up getting true, which is a little bit strange. And if I use triple equal signs, I get false. So that's just something to keep in mind. And if I say is NAN equals equals to NAN, I actually get false there, which is kind of weird behavior. And we'll be talking a lot more about that later on. But I do want you to be aware of there's some funky behavior when you're checking for equality and you're just doing comparison operators with these null, undefined, and NAN values. So keep that in mind. We'll touch on this later on, but this is just something for you to be aware of. To begin with, a lot of our problems won't even deal with null or undefined values, so don't worry about it too much right now. Let's clear that out, and let's begin talking about logical operators. Logical operators just allow us to combine multiple comparison operators. So let's say we wanted to know if 1 is equal to 1, and we also wanted to know if 2 is equal to 2. Well, how could I combine both of those? Typically, you would use an AND operator. And in the case of JavaScript, the AND operator uses two ampersands, which is this symbol right here. So here I can check is 1 equal to 1 and is 2 equal to 2. In that case, they're both true. So in order for this to return true, both of these statements have to be true. And I can actually tack on more than that. So I could say is 1 triple equals to 1 and is 2 equal to 2 and is 1 equal to 2. And this returns false because while these first two were true, this last one was false. And because they're all ands, they all have to be true. Then if we clear the screen here, we can also use OR operators. And OR operators are written with what's known as the pipe operator and they only need one condition to be true to return true. So for instance, is one equal to two? And that's what or looks like, that pipe operator. You usually find it above the enter or shift key on your keyboard and you just do shift uh, backslash to actually get that pipe operator. What we see is one equal to two or is one equal to one and that's true because only one of these conditions had to be true. And then we also have the not operator. So not operator, that's not as common to use, no pun intended there, but let's also check it out. It's basically a way of checking the opposite of a condition. So for instance, I'll put this in parentheses. If I wanna check is one equal to one, well, that's true. What if I wanna check if the opposite is true? Well, then I can add an exclamation point in front of this to check. So this exclamation mark will return the opposite of whatever is in here. And the opposite of true is false. So when I hit enter, I should see false there. So it's, again, it's basically a way of checking the opposite of a condition. And you can also stack these. So you can do exclamation mark, exclamation mark, one equals equals one. But this is definitely not that common to use. And hopefully you never see just a bunch of exclamation marks like this because Really, this kind of makes no sense, and this is just bad code, but it is functional code. Okay, so that's really all there is to discuss about comparison operators and logical operators. For the most part, they're pretty straightforward. The only things I really want you to pay attention to 
is the use of this triple equal sign versus just the double equal sign. And I want you throughout the course to be extra vigilant about that, especially when you're working with JavaScript. And I also want you to be aware of this kind of weird behavior with null, undefined, and NAN. We won't run into this that often throughout this course, but I do want you to be aware of it. And then scrolling back down all the way to the bottom of the notes, we have some exercises here. So let me just expand this and show you. So here are a few, there's five quick exercise questions for you. And what I want you to do is knowing that x is equal to one and y is equal to two, mentally evaluate these expressions right here. So there's five expressions for you to mentally evaluate them. Once you think you know the answer in your head, just copy and paste this line to the console to actually see if you are correct. So let's do the first one together and then I'll let you do the other four on your own. So if x is equal to one and y is equal to two, let's see what we have here. On this left hand side, I see is the string two equals equals to the number two. Well, we learned previously that doubles equal sign instead of triple equal sign will only check for the value, not the actual data type. So I know this side is true. And then I say, and is x triple equals to one. So that's checking both for value and data type. Well, I know that the number one is equal to the number one. So I believe that exercise one should return true since both sides of this and statement are true. Let's check it out. I'm going to copy this and paste it into my console. So I have those two variables and now let's copy and paste this line, put it into my console and it looks like I was correct. We got true. Okay. So that's basically all I want you to do. Mentally evaluate the other four here and you can check your own solutions against the console commands. Okay. Thanks everyone. If you have any questions, feel free to post the Q and A forums. I'll see you at the next lecture. Hello everyone, and welcome to part five, Control Flow. Control Flow is a fundamental aspect of any full programming language, and it allows us to execute code only if a certain situation or condition arises, and we can use it in combination with logical and comparison operators. In case this is your first time programming, we're going to briefly go over the main concepts of Control Flow, such as if statements, else statements, and else if statements in this lecture. If you've already programmed in another language before, you may actually find it more useful just to reference the notes for this lecture to get the JavaScript syntax, since a lot of these concepts are the same across programming languages. The only thing that's different is the actual syntax. So let's continue on and actually discuss control flow. So usually when you're dealing with control flow, you're going to initiate some sort of condition check that returns a Boolean, which is either true or false. And then based off those results, you use control flow to execute a specific block of code. Let's see the first basic example, which is an if statement. So an if statement, the general syntax looks like this. You say if, and then some condition. And that condition right there is usually some sort of comparison operator, or you're checking for some sort of equality. So we say, if this condition is true, we execute some code that's inside those curly brackets. So the syntax is if, in parentheses, the condition check, and then in curly brackets, you're going to execute some sort of code. Then there's the if else statement. And the main logic behind this is if some condition is true, you execute some code, that very first line there. Else, meaning if that condition was not true, you execute some other code. So here we're just checking if a condition is true, we execute some code. If it doesn't happen to be true, then the else statement occurs and we execute some other code. And then we have the if, else if, and else statements. So if you want to check for multiple conditions, not just one, you can add an else if statement. So the syntax looks like this. We say if, you check for some condition number one, you execute some code. Then you can have an else if to check for another possible condition. And then you execute some other code. If condition one and condition two don't bring up true, so neither of those conditions happen to be true, then finally the else block executes some backup code. Okay, let's actually code through some examples. That was just general syntax and a very high level overview. But I think if we code through some examples, it'll make it a lot clearer. I'm going to open up my editor and my browser now. All right, so here I have an HTML file open and a JavaScript file open. They're both blank and my browser is connected right now to that HTML file. So let's actually fill in this HTML file and then also connect it to the script. So I'm gonna write script. I can get rid of that and just say the source is my script.js. 
Okay, and let's make sure this is working by adding some sort of alert here that says, hello, save this, I'll refresh my page, and I get the alert, hello. Great, so we're connected to the JavaScript. That way, if I wanna run more than one line of JavaScript code, all I have to do is type it to this .js file and then refresh my browser over here. And let's actually open up the console here as well. So I'm going to say inspect, hit the console, and now I can see output. So to begin seeing an if statement in action, we're going to start by creating two variables. First, we'll create hot, and we'll say it's false. And then I'll create another variable called temp, and I will say it's equal to 60. And what we're going to do is just apply some very simple logic code. So we say if some condition is true, then we execute the code inside of those curly brackets. So for example, we have these two variables, hot and temp, and imagine that hot starts off as false and temperature or temp is some number in degrees. And if the temp is greater than 80, we want to assign hot is equal to true. So if it's more than 80 degrees, I'm going to say that it, it, hot is now true. So what does this look like? Well, I can say if, and I can actually hit enter here, and Adam will automatically fill in that sort of syntax scaffolding. And the most basic if statement is just if true. So let's run this one first. I'm going to say if true, I will log I ran. Refresh the page here, and it says I ran. So that's the very most basic if statement. If true, and then this always runs because it will always be true. Let's show you something a little more realistic using those two variables. I'll say if the temperature is greater than 80, log temp is greater than 80. We'll save that, refresh our page, and now we actually don't get any output, which makes sense because remember, temperature is 60. But now let's do this. If temperature is greater than 80, I will say hot is equal to true. And this is actually the first time we show this, but this is how you can reassign a variable in JavaScript. So right now I initiated it with the var call. So this is for initializing that variable, but if I just wanna reassign it, I have to make sure it's reassigned to the same data type here. So it's also a Boolean, but in this case, I'm reassigning it to true. And then I'm going to log hot. So let's see what happens. If I refresh this page, I get false. So what actually happened here? Well, I have my variable, hot is equal to false, the temperature is 60. I said, if the temperature is greater than 80, reassign hot to be true, and then finally output hot. Since temperature was not greater than 80, this reassignment never occurred, meaning hot is always going to stay false. Now let's try this again, but set the temperature to be higher than 80, 100. So take a moment and think what we'll see when I actually refresh this page. Will it be false or true? I'm going to refresh, and it's true, which makes sense because the temperature is now 100, meaning if the temperature is greater than 80, 100 is greater than 80, reassign hot to be equal to true, and then log whatever hot currently is, and hot was reassigned to true. And that's the very basics of an if statement. Now let's imagine that we want to execute another block that occurs if the if statement is false. Well, in that case, we can use an else statement to do this. Let's add that in. So I'm going to say just console log up here. Console log hot outside. So if the temperature is greater than 80, I'm going to say it's hot outside. Else, and you can see that Adam's helping me out here, so I'll just take its help. Else, I will log it's not very hot today. And you might be wondering, hey, why doesn't else actually have this parentheses check here? And the reason is because else doesn't need to check for any specific condition. Remember, else is going to occur only if all the conditions above it never were activated. They were never true. Okay, so let's try this again. I'm going to delete this line right here, and I'm going to set temperature equal to 100. So let's think what's going to log if I set temperature equal to 100. I'll refresh this page, and it says it's hot outside. So that makes sense. If the temperature is greater than 80, log it's hot outside. Now let's set the temperature to be 50 degrees. What do we think is gonna happen when I refresh the page? 
it's not very hot today. That makes sense because this if statement was never triggered as true, meaning this else statement is going to occur. It's not very hot today. And that's the basics of an if else statement. Okay, so we saw how if statements work, how if else statements work. Now let's see how else if statements work. So again, if we want to check more conditions than just one single condition and its opposite, we can add else if statements to check for multiple specific conditions. And the way it looks is like this. And you can see that Adam text editor will actually help us out. And we see else if, I'll hit enter. And it makes sense that there's parentheses here now because I want to check if another certain condition is true. So let's actually check for multiple temperature ranges. So right now, if the temperature is greater than 80 degrees, I say it's hot outside. Now let's imagine that it's just pretty average or nice outside. So the temperature is less than or equal to 80. And the temperature is greater than or equal to 50 degrees. So somewhere in between 50 and 80, I'll say average temp outside. Now let's check for another condition. Again, we'll call else if, and inside this parentheses, I'll put in another condition, something like temperature less than 50, and temperature greater than or equal to 32 degrees. I'll log that it's pretty cold out. And then finally, I'm going to want an else statement. And for this else statement, I'm going to say it is very cold out. And the reason for that is because I know the else statement is only going to occur if the temperature is not greater than 80, it's not in between 80 and 50, and it's not in between 32 and 50, meaning else statement is only going to occur when the temperature is less than 32 degrees. So let's try this out and make sure we got everything right. I'm going to refresh my page here. Remember, our starting temperature is 50 degrees. So if I refresh this, I would expect it to say average temp outside because we fall right here. Temperature is equal to 50. Let's make average temp outside go again with something like 70 degrees. Save this, refresh, and there it is again, average temperature outside. Let's make it say it's pretty cold out. So I'll say it's 40 degrees outside. Refresh, and it says it's pretty cold out. And now let's make it something like 10 degrees. If I refresh this page, then it says it is very cold out, meaning none of these conditions were actually activated, so the else statement was activated. Okay, let's do one final example of comparison operators. So I will delete all this, and let's start with kind of a store example. So I'll make a variable called ham, set it equal to 10, whoops, variable called ham, set it equal to 10, and then I'll create another variable called cheese, and set it equal to 10. And we'll discuss semicolons later on. You don't actually need those there, so don't worry about having semicolons everywhere right now. But let's say we want to report back to headquarters what our ham and cheese sales were. We run a little store that sells ham and cheese. So I'm going to make my variable report equal to a string that's just blank right now. And then I'll start off with my first if statement and I will say if the sales of ham is greater than 10, greater than or equal to 10, and cheese is greater than or equal to 10, I'm going to say my report is equal to strong sales of both ham and cheese. Then let's have an else if statement. And the else if statement is going to say, else if ham is equal to zero and cheese is equal to zero, my report is going to be equal to nothing sold. And let's keep things simple with an else statement. And I will say report is equal to we had some sales of items. 
And you can keep adding else if statements for things like if you only sold ham or do you only sold cheese that day, what would it look like? But at the end of this, outside of these if statements, I'm going to say log or console.log and I will log my report. So let's refresh this and see what we get. So it says strong sales of both ham and cheese. That makes sense. Ham and cheese are both 10 right now. Let's say ham is one. We'll refresh this page. We had some sales of items. That makes sense. And let's change it so that nothing was sold. Ham is equal to zero and cheese is equal to zero. Refresh our page and it says nothing sold. Okay, great. Hopefully now you have a general understanding of if statements, if else statements, and else if statements in JavaScript. Coming up next, we're going to begin discussing loops with the while loop. Thanks everyone, and I'll see you at the next lecture. Hello everyone, and welcome to part six, while loops. So let's learn a bit about while loops in JavaScript. And loops in general allow us to automatically repeat blocks of code. And the while loop will continually execute code as long as the condition remains true. And like I mentioned for the previous lecture, if you're already familiar with while loops from another programming language, you may just want to check the notes for this lecture and just reference the syntax changes yourself. Okay, in case you're new to a while loop, let's see what it actually looks like. So in JavaScript, the while loop looks like this. You say the keyword while, and then in parentheses, you have some sort of condition. And then inside the curly brackets, you execute some code, and that code is going to be continually executed while that condition is true. And something to be careful with while loops is if you have a condition that will always remain true no matter what, then that while loop will execute forever. And that may lead to buggy code because your while loop just never breaks, it always stays running forever. Okay, let's see some actual examples. And we're also going to learn about a few keywords such as the break keyword, which will break out of a top level block of code. Let's jump to our editor to get started. Okay, so just like last time, I have an HTML script that's connected to my JavaScript, this myscript.js, and that in turn has the HTML connected to this browser. So let's get started with a very simple while loop example. I'm going to create a variable called x and set it equal to zero. And then I can begin typing while, hit enter, and Adam helps me out with the rest of the context. So I say while x is less than five. That's the condition I want. I'm going to perform some action. I will log x is currently, and then I'm going to say plus x here. So that prints out. And then I'm also going to log x is still less than five, adding one to x. And then finally, to make sure this doesn't run forever, I'm going to say x is equal to x plus one. So before we run this, let's break down what's actually happening here. I start off with x equals zero. This is outside this while loop. Then inside this while loop, I'll say, while x is less than five, I want you to execute this block of code. And the first block of code, or the first line of code on line four says, just x is currently, and then whatever the current number of x is. And then, as long as x is still less than five, my condition, I'll also log, x is still less than five, adding one to x. And then finally, on line seven, I'll say x is equal to x plus one. So I reassign x to the current x plus one. And I'll also show you later on some syntax to have a shortcut of doing this sort of operation. But let's save that. And now let's run our browser or refresh our browser page here and see what we get. So we get a lot of output. Let's expand this and see what's happening here. So I get X is currently zero. That makes sense. So it's still less than five. I add one to X, X is currently one. And this keeps going all the way until it prints out X is currently four, which makes sense. If X is currently four, I would log x is still less than five, adding one to x. And note that once I add one to x, then x becomes five. And five is no longer less than five, it's equal to five. So the while loop stops operating, which is why we never see x is currently five. And that's the very basics of how a while loop works. Okay, now let's add in some manual break conditions, which will exit out of the loop. And it's gonna use the keyword break. So right now I'm gonna start with variable x is equal to zero. I'll say while x is less than five. 
and I'm going to console again log, x is currently x, and then here I'm going to add in some control flow with an if statement. And I will say if x is equal to 3, I'm going to log x is equal to 3. And that's all I'll do for now. So let's run this code again and see what happens. So it looks like very much the same code, 0, 1, 2, 3, except when x is currently 3, before I say x is less than 5, I get this big announcement, x is equal to 3. Now let's actually try to break the while loop on this certain condition. And the way we can do that is by adding in the special keyword break. And this will break out of the top level loop it's in. Basically what it says, what this is saying is if x is equal to 3, log this and then break out of the top level loop you find this keyword in. And that happens to be this while loop. So let's save this, expand this, and refresh the page. And now we see when I refresh, it stops at this S, x is equal to 3 line. So it says x is equal to 3, and then it breaks out of that while loop. And that's how we can use the keyword break to essentially prematurely break out of a while loop so that we don't have to wait until this condition is naturally meant to be false. And that's really all there is to the while loop. We'll use it later on in the course, but as a quick exercise, I want you to do this. Write a while loop that prints out only the even numbers from 1 to 10. So again, just to clarify what I want you to do right now, I'll write it in here as a comment. Write a while loop that prints out only the even numbers from 1 to 10. Okay, so pause the video, see if you can do it on your own, and then I'm going to write out the solution for this question. Just write a while loop that prints out only the even numbers from 1 to 10. Okay, so let's get started with this. I'm going to clear everything I have here in my editor. Hopefully you were able to actually do this yourself, or at least attempt it yourself. But everything's clear, so let's try it out. Okay, so let's see how we can attempt to solve this problem. First thing I'm going to do is create a variable called num, and start it off equal to 1. Then I'm going to create my while loop, and I want to go from numbers 1 to 10. So I will say, while my number is less than 11, and let's just start off with a very simple example. I will log the number, and then say num is equal to num plus 1. Save this, and let's see if this works. Refresh the page, and here I get all the numbers from 1 to 10 but the assignment is to only print out these even numbers. So I need some sort of method to check if a number is even. And hopefully you remember from the number or the very basics of JavaScript lecture, that very first JavaScript lecture, we taught you the mod operator. So I'm going to say if num mod two is equal to zero, then I can do something and I know that the number is even. So I will log that number. So what does that actually mean? Well, remember that mod checks for a remainder. And I know if a number divided by 2 leaves a remainder equal to 0, then that number is even. So 6 divided by 2 has no remainder, 8 divided by 2 has no remainder, etc. Okay. And then lastly, I want to make sure this doesn't run forever. So outside of that if, I'm going to say num is equal to num plus 1. So let's save that and see if I refresh the page, it works. And there we have it, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10. And those are all the even numbers from 1 to 10 using a while loop. Take your time if this was a little confusing for you. And some th key things to remember here is this mod operator. This is a really common way to check if a number is even. And also key to this is to remember to increase the number and to remember to increase the number outside of this if statement. If you only had it inside of this if statement, that would cause problems because you would only be adding one if the number was even. You wouldn't do it on the odd numbers. And you can tell if something is within the block using these curly brackets as indicators. And indentation for JavaScript doesn't matter a whole lot, although you should try to keep your code readable and clean. Later on when we talk about Python, indentation is going to be a huge aspect of it. Okay, so thanks everyone, and I will see you at the next lecture, where we're going to begin to discuss for loops. I'll see you there.
Hello everyone, and welcome to part 7, for loops. So we're going to be learning about the most basic for loop in JavaScript in this lecture, and if you've only dealt with for loops in Python before, you may actually want to watch this lecture instead of just reading the notes, because the syntax for a for loop or a basic for loop in JavaScript is going to appear quite different to you versus Python's for loop. Okay, so what is a for loop? Well, a for loop allows you to continually execute code, usually a specific number of times, or linked to the elements in a sequence. Now, JavaScript has three types of for loops. It has its most basic for loop, which just iterates through some block of code a certain number of times. Then it has the for in construct, which loops through a JavaScript object. And a JavaScript object is a data structure in JavaScript that we haven't covered yet. And then there's also the for of loop, which is used with JavaScript arrays, which again is another data structure we haven't actually covered yet. So until we cover those, we'll leave for in loops and for of loops aside for now. And as a quick note, previously we used the notation num is equal to num plus one, when during a loop we wanted to increment the variable num by just one. There's also two other ways of writing that, and that is num plus equal to one, or num plus plus. And if you wanted to subtract one, you would just say num minus equals one or num minus minus. So these are all the same. All three of these statements are doing the exact same thing. That's just a heads up because with JavaScript, the most common one you'll see is the very last one, num plus plus. All right, this is what the most basic version of a for loop in JavaScript looks like. You have your for keyword statement, and then you have three other statements separated by semicolon inside of parentheses and inside curly brackets, you execute some code for the for loop. So let's actually describe what each of these statements represents, and we'll show you an example as we go along. So statement one is executed before the loop or that code block even begins. And that can be something like defining the variable i is equal to zero. And we can think of that similar to the while loop where we just said something like num is equal to zero or x is equal to zero. So statement one is executed before the loop even really starts. Then we have statement two, which is there in the middle. And statement two, defines the condition for running the loop. And in this case, we can almost think of this for loop as just another syntax way of writing a while loop. So what's an example of that? Well, statement two could be something like this, while i is less than five. So here we can see we're almost just rewriting a while loop inside of this for statement. We're starting off with the variable i is equal to zero, and we're saying keep running this loop while i is less than five. And then finally, statement three is what is executed each time after the loop cycles through once. So just like a while loop we saw earlier, we may want to incrementally add to i. So here, what this for loop is saying is start off with the variable i is equal to zero. And while i is less than five, do some code, and then every cycle you're going to add one to i, or i plus plus. All right, so let's see some examples of for loops in the editor. All right, so here's my editor, and I have my browser with my console open, and it's linked just as we've done in previous lectures. Let's start off with the most basic for loop that we initially discussed. So again, I'm gonna say something like four, and I can actually hit enter here. Note that Adam gives you the three options, the four, four in, and then four of. We'll start with just the most basic four. We hit enter, and what's really nice is Adam takes care of a lot of the stuff right now. It takes care of statement one, that initialization of a variable, takes care of statement two, which is what we actually want to run through, kind of the while condition, and then I plus plus, or statement three, what we wanna happen after every time this is run. Now, let's actually change the array.length to just be less than five. And we're going to say console.log number is, and then we'll concatenate it with i. So let's save this and actually run this here. And here I can see number is zero, one, two, three, and four. And hopefully you can see this is basically just another way of rewriting a for loop, or excuse me, a while loop, where we have some initial condition, the while condition, and then what we wanna do after every time this loop run. And like I mentioned earlier, this I++ is just another way of writing I is equal to I plus one. So I can save that, and if I refresh, I'll get the exact same result. And another note, is that this doesn't actually have to be i. You could call this whatever you want. So you could say variable num, while num is less than five. And we could say num plus plus. Write that as num, save this, we refresh, and we get the exact same result. 
It's most commonly used for I, so keep that in mind. You'll see I a lot, but sometimes it might be helpful to you to rename it if it helps the readability of your code. But more often than not, you're just going to see it as I. And it's so often I that that's why Atom Text Editor auto fills it to be I. Okay, so let's continue on with another example. I'm going to create a variable called word, and let's just have it be the first few letters of the alphabet. A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K. Okay, and then I'll start typing four, hit enter, and I'm going to say for i is equal to zero, i array.length, and Atom Text Editor actually auto highlights array for me to change it to something. So I will change it to word, and then you can see that it's actually auto filling that in for me over inside the for loop, which is quite nice. And I'm going to log this. So I will say log, whoops, let me click somewhere to deactivate that, and then we'll say log, and I'm gonna input word indexed at that location. Okay, so let's save this. And what do you think is gonna happen here? Take some time. So we'll refresh, and we see here now we get A, B, C, D, E, F, G, all the way to K. So again, this is just a way of kind of rewriting the while loop. So we start at I equals a zero, and while I is less than the length of the actual word, keep incrementing I, and then print out the index location at I, so A, B, C, D, et cetera. All right, now let's show you another example where let's say we wanted to skip every other letter or something. So to make that obvious, I will do something like this. A, B, A, B, A, B, A, B, A, B. And then I'll write a for loop here. And I'm gonna keep most things the same, except over here, where it says I plus plus, I can do something like I is equal to I plus two. And let's log this again and put that inside. And now what do you think is going to happen when I refresh this page? Well, I can see A printed out five times. And if something is repeatedly input into the console, uh, Google Chrome will actually just put a little number here next to it instead of flooding your screen with repeated code or repeated output. So this little number here represents that A was printed out five times, which makes sense because if you look at this, we have one, two, three, four, five A's in that word. So hopefully you can see here that it doesn't have to just increment by one, it can increment by any number you want, or it can even go down, it can decrease. Okay, so that's all we need to know about for loops in JavaScript for now. Coming up next, we're going to do a quick exercise just to practice your understanding. I'll see you at the next lecture. Hello everyone and welcome back to part eight, loop exercises. So you've learned enough about loops, it's time to do just a few exercises. The exercises are located under the JavaScript level one folder and the file you're looking for is called part eight underscore loops underscore exercise dot JS. And then there's also a solutions JavaScript. So make sure you don't peek at the solutions before attempting them on your own. In the next lecture, I'll be walking through the actual exercise solutions. So check out the JavaScript. All the instructions are comment code in that actual file. Just open it up and follow the directions. I'll see you at the next lecture. Hello everyone, and welcome back to part eight we're going to be going over the solutions to the loop exercise questions from the previous lecture. So let's continue. I'm going to open up my editor to get started. Okay, here I have the actual problems uploaded in the JavaScript with the comments that I had to follow. And what we're going to be doing first is problem one, where I had to use a for loop to print or console log out the word hello five times. And we never actually did something quite like this, but hopefully you were able to figure it out with both methods. So if a while loop, Let's show you how we can do that. We'll say variable x is equal to zero. And you could have chosen any variable name here. The name doesn't actually matter. Then we'll say a while loop. And I will say while x is less than five, I'm going to console.log hello. And then I want to remember to add one to x and increment it. So now if I run my code, I see hello, and it's been output five times. Google Chrome just lets you know that with this little shortcut, the bubble of five there. Up next, we have the for loop, and I wanted to use a for loop to do this. So essentially, you can just break down what we were doing up here above. So I have variable i is equal to zero, since i is going to be less than five. I'll put that here. 
and I'll leave I++, and then I can actually just copy and paste the console log command. And just to make sure it's actually working, I'm going to say something like hello with for loop. We'll save that. Let's run this code. And I see hello and then hello with for loop. They both ran five times. Great. Let's move on to problem two. Problem two was just to use loops to console.log or print out all the odd numbers from one to 25. And we wanted to do this using two methods, the while loop and then a for loop. Let's start off with the while loop. I'm going to make a variable called num. And in the solutions, I actually just reassign num from a previous problem. And then I'm going to say while my num is less than 25 if num mod 2 is not equal to 0. Remember previously if we wanted to check for an even number we said num mod 2 equal to 0. In this case we're doing the exact opposite for odd numbers. I'm going to log that num. And then I also want to make sure that I continually add to num so I'll just say num plus plus. So let's make sure that actually worked. I'm going to refresh my page here and there are all the odd numbers 1 all the way to 23 for the while loop. And now for the for loop let's do that as well. I'm going to say for and then I'm going to fix some of these so it says instead of the actual length of the array this is going to be 5. Let's expand this a little bit. So I'm going to say if I mod 2 is not equal to 0 log i. And that's really all there is to this. Let's make sure my brackets are balanced. So we'll save that. And let's comment everything else out so we make sure that only that is running. So we'll save this, scroll the way down, refresh my page. And here I only see 1 through 3, so let me make sure I went all the way. That should have been 25. Okay, now let's refresh our page. And there we have it, 1 through 23. Great. And that's how you could do it with a for loop. So that's it, just two pretty simple problems, and hopefully you can begin to see the relationship between the while loop and the for loop. Okay, thanks everybody, and in the next lecture, we're going to get practice on everything we covered in JavaScript Level 1 with a little bit of an assessment project. Thanks, and I'll see you at the next lecture. Hello everyone, and welcome back to Part 9, JavaScript Level 1 Project. So we've completed all the normal lectures for JavaScript level one, and now it's time to actually do a project. And for this project, you'll be creating a simple website that asks a visitor questions using JavaScript and the prompt function that we worked with earlier. However, through all of these questions, you're going to be secretly checking to see if there's a spy present. And the spy is going to answer the questions in a very particular way. Behind the scenes, you're going to be using JavaScript to check for certain correct answers to the questions. And if you find the spy due to the correct answers, you're going to leave them a secret message in the console for them to check. Okay, you're going to be needing to check the part 9 underscore js underscore project .html file for the full instructions and the full correct answers. An example solution of the JavaScript file is located under part 9.js. So remember to link to your own .js script before getting started. So again, you're only going to be editing a JavaScript file. You won't actually be touching any HTML. All right, let's briefly explore the instruction page and see an example of what it should look like after you're done with it. I'm going to hop over to the editor and browser now. Okay, here I have the actual HTML document open in my editor, and I also have it linked to the JavaScript file that contains the solutions. And this is what it looks like over here in the browser. So again, just quickly to point out, if you scroll all the way down on the part nine JavaScript project.html page, right here under the script connection, it will connect to the solution script. So it'll actually connect to part 9.js. That's what you can connect it to if you want to see what an example solution looks like in your browser. But I recommend that once you're done dealing with that, you change the source to your own JavaScript file so you can play around with working through the solution. Again, everything you're doing is just in a JavaScript file. You won't actually be editing any HTML for this. So let me show you what the actual HTML looks like. I've linked it here in my browser. I'm going to zoom in a little bit so we can read it together. But here we have the welcome to part nine, your JavaScript level one project. 
And like I mentioned, for this project, you're going to be building a generic website that just seems to ask some mundane questions to normal users, but secretly you are looking for a spy. And anyone visiting your website is going to be asked a series of questions, but only the spy is going to give you specific answers that you expect. And if all the questions are answered correctly, you're going to post a secret message in the console for the spy to read. So it's up to you whatever the secret message is, but you're going to use console.log if they answer the questions correctly. So here are the four conditions you're going to be checking for the spy. So the spy has the same first letter of her first name and her last name. So for example, someone could be named Jose Johnson and J and J match. So that's the first letter and last letter. So that's a correct condition for the spy. The spy is also between the age of 20 and 30, exclusive of 20 and 30. So for example, a 26 year old spy works. Then the spy is also at least 170 centimeters tall. Here we have 175 centimeters. And then the spy has a pet name that ends with the letter Y. And in this case, a pet name of Sammy would work. So you're gonna ask the spy for their first name, last name, what is their age, what is, what is their height in centimeters, and what is their pet name. And if they answer everything correctly, according to these conditions, so you're gonna check these conditions using everything you learned about control flow, you will log a secret message to the console. And then they can inspect the page, look at the console, and see if you left them anything. All right. So again, we're just using JavaScript here and you can prompt for the information in any order you want. And you can even do things like separate the first name prompt from the last name prompt. That'll probably make your life a little easier. But all we're doing is just checking to see if these four conditions are true. This one, this one, this one, and this one. So let's actually refresh this page and see what happens, what this actually looks like. I'm gonna refresh and it says, hello and welcome, please enter your first name. We'll say Jose, enter your last name, We'll say Johnson. How old are you? We'll say 26. We'll say we're 175 centimeters. And the, ne the name of our pet is Sammy. I'll hit OK. It says, thank you so much for the information. I hit OK. And that's it. It looks like nothing happened. But if I inspect and go to my console, it says, welcome, comrade. You've passed the spy test. And that's exactly what you're going to be doing. Let's refresh this page and make sure that if I just input garbage, so Let's say my name is Andy, Will, I'm 42, I'm 10 centimeters tall, my name of my pet is, I don't know, Fad, hit OK, and it says, sorry, nothing to see here. Okay, hopefully you get an idea of what this project's actually getting at. In the next lecture, I'll be coding out some solutions in the JavaScript file. Thanks everyone, hope you enjoy the project, I'll see you at the next lecture. Hello everyone and welcome back. Hopefully you already attempted the JavaScript level one project because in this lecture we'll be coding through an example solution for it. Okay, I'm excited so let's get started by hopping over to the editor. Okay, so here I have my editor open. I've linked the HTML file to my own script. My script is right now empty so nothing's going on when I refresh this page. So let's expand our editor, add everything we need and then we'll test it out with the actual website page. So I'm going to zoom in just a little more so we can see everything clearly. Okay, the first thing I need to do is have the four conditions that I'm going to be checking. Remember those four conditions are this. It's the name condition, so I'm going to make variables for these. And the name condition will have it be null to start off with. And the name condition is, does their first name, first letter of their first name match the first letter of their last name? And you can actually not have them be null. They can be anything because we're gonna be reassigning these later on. But I'm just gonna make them null to be clear that they're nothing right now. And if we want, we can put semicolons there. The age condition, so they have to be between 20 and 30 exclusive. We also have the height condition. And that's going to be null. And then we also finally have the pet name condition. So I will say var pet condition is null. Okay, so those are the four conditions that I'm checking for. But remember, I'm actually going to need to add, ask some questions first. So let's put those questions at the top. I'm going to grab the first name. It's going to be a prompt, whoops, not what I wanted, a prompt. And I will ask first name, please. And you can basically write as much or as little as you want in that. Then we'll ask for the last name. 
and I'm going to, ah, oh, sorry about that. <laughs> there it is, prompt, okay. I'm going to ask for the last name, please. And then the next variable I want is age. So I'm going to ask, how old are you? Question mark. I also want height. So that's another prompt. So just a bunch of prompts that we ask the user when they reach the page. What is your height? Question mark. And then finally, pet name. We'll ask for a prompt. What is your pet name? Question mark. So we have everything. After all of that, I'm just going to say an alert. Thank you so much for the information. And it doesn't matter a whole lot whether we define these four condition variables before or after this, but I like the idea of grabbing all the variables that we need from the user first and then having all our logic below it. So we have those four conditions. Let's start using control flow to actually check if these conditions are true or false. So the first one we need to check is the name condition. So remember the name condition asks, is the first letter of their first name and the first letter of their last name the same thing? So I'm going to say, if first name index at zero is equal to last name index at zero, set the name condition to be equal to true. Else, the name condition is going to be equal to false. And that's a quick and easy way we can check if their first letter of their first name matches the first letter of their last name. Now we want to check the age condition. So how do we do that? Well, we want to say if age is greater than 20, so remember we're doing exclusive, so I don't put that equal sign, and age is less than 30, so we make sure not to overshoot this, I will say that the age condition is equal to true. Else, I know they didn't pass the age test, so age condition is equal to false. And hopefully now you can see why we could have assigned something else for the age condition. We could have assigned them all to be true or all to be false to begin with. Moving along, we have our age, we have the first name check, and now I want to check the height condition. So I will say if height is greater than or equal to 170, remember it was at least 170, then I want my height condition, we can see Adam helping us out here, to be true. And just like we've done last time, I'll say else height condition is equal to false. Pretty simple and pretty straightforward so far. And then last but not least, I want to make sure that the pet name is ending with Y. This one's a little tricky because we haven't shown anything quite like this, but hopefully you're able to figure it out. I'll say if the pet name, and then somehow I want to grab the last letter of the pet name. So how do I actually do that? Well, we know how to grab the first letter, which is just zero. But if I want to grab the last letter, I'm going to have to take into account that pet names can be of different lengths. And one way I can do that is by calling pet name dot length. So we might think that this gives us the very last letter, but remember indexing starts at zero, which means I need to subtract one from this in order to make it work. So you can imagine that if I had the pet name just be the letter A, and I wanna check the last letter of the string of a single letter, I'd have to check zero, right? So even if it has length of one, I'd have to say one minus one to actually grab that last letter. So that's just a quick explanation of why I have to do the minus one here. It's because indexing starts at zero. And if you don't believe me, you can kind of check it out and play with it yourself. And I wanna make sure this is equal to y. And if that's the case, then I know the pet condition will be reassigned to true. Else, I'll say pet condition is equal to false. Great, so I have the pet name there, and now I just wanna check if all four conditions are true. So check all conditions.
And what I'm going to do here is say if the name condition is true and the age condition is true and the height condition is true and the pet condition is true, I'm going to log something like welcome spy else we can either not do anything or just say nothing to see here. And sometimes what confuses beginners is the fact that I'm just writing here the actual condition. I'm not saying something like name condition equals true and age condition equals true, etc. But remember, these are already Booleans themselves. So these conditions should already be Booleans by the time they get to this stage. They're either all true or all false or some combination of true and false. Meaning I don't need to actually check is equal equal true because they're actually all conditional checks. So basically it's going to be something like true and false and true and false or false and false and false or true and true and true, etc. Okay, so you can always review the actual part 9.javascript if you want the written code for everything I just did here. But let's save this and actually test it out to make sure it worked. Going to expand this, we are going to refresh. And here we see first name please. I'll input Jose. Last name we'll say John. How old am I? We'll say we're 27. What is my height? I'll say 180 centimeters. Pet name, I'll say Frankie of Hawaii. Thanks so much for the information. We right click, inspect, check the console, and it says welcome spy. Let's make sure the inverse is true. So if I refresh this page, first name, just gonna insert some garbage. Last name, some other garbage. How old am I? I'm 12 years old. We'll say we're 120 centimeters and pet name is Alf. And it says nothing to see here. Perfect. So it looks like our solution worked correctly. Okay, if you have any questions, feel free to post them to the Q&A forums, but you are now complete with JavaScript level one. It's time to move on to JavaScript level two. Thanks, and I'll see you at the next section of the course.